It's funny when I've when these speakers have been on my show, I feel like I've done these intros just without a bunch of people watching before. But this next gentleman is uh, was one of my favorite guests uh, I've had on, and I know I'll have him on again. He is Dr. Clark Carlton. He's an author and editor of the Ludwell Orthodox Fellowship. He has taught philosophy for more than 25 years. A, a native of Tennessee, he earned a BA in philosophy from Carson Newman College, an MDiv from St. Vladimir Seminary, and an MA and PhD from the Catholic University of America. This series that I'm going to say he's the author of, I highly recommend for anyone who's not read the series. He is the author of the Faith series and has been published in the St. Vladimir's Theological Quarterly, the Journal of Early Christian Studies, Christian Bioethics, and uh, a long word that I can't quite read, but uh, He's a lot smarter than I am, and I'll give him over to you right now, Dr. Clark Carlton. Thank you, Buck. Are you ready to have your feathers ruffled? Because I come here today to praise ethnophilitism, not to condemn it. Because many of us, however, have been the victims of bad history and even worse theology, I fear that statement may scandalize some. So for the sake of those of a tender conscience, I will begin my talk today by explaining what the word actually means, and then I'll get to the substance of what I want to talk about. The word ethnophilitism simply means concern for one's own people, one's tribe, one's ethnos. Of course, we are commanded by our Lord to love everyone, even as God himself loves every human being without exception. But we are neither eternal nor omnipresent, neither omniscient nor omnipotent. As embodied persons dwelling in time, there are practical limits to the range of our affections and the extent of our concern. Indeed, our Lord himself expressed our duties less in terms of universal obligation than in terms of proximity. Love thy neighbor as thyself. When asked, who is my neighbor? He replied with the parable of the Good Samaritan. Our neighbor, it would seem, is simply the one who is at hand, regardless of ethnicity or even religion. How then can it be a sin, or a heresy as some would have it, to love one's own, who after all are most likely to be at hand and to whom we are bound by the bonds of natural affection. Christianity is the fulfillment of our created nature. It is not its abrogation. So where did this idea that ethnophilitism or love of one's own is somehow a heresy? In 1872, a council was held in Constantinople to deal with the creation of an ethnic Bulgarian exarchate on territory of the ecumenical patriarchate. This council is the source of the so-called condemnation of ethnophilitism or just plain philitism. We have to understand that since the Ottoman conquest, the Sea of Constantinople had been secured by payments to the Sultan. Indeed, by this time, virtually all of the Episcopal sees in the Patriarchate were obtained by outright simony. Moreover, the Sultan's designation of the Patriarch as ethnarch responsible for all the room on the territory of the Ottoman Empire, made the patriarch a political as well as spiritual leader. It was dissatisfaction with this sorry state of affairs that led the Bulgarians to create their own exarchate independent of the Greek patriarchate. Russia and Serbia refused to attend or recognize the council. Jerusalem later refused it. So whatever else may be said about it, the Council of 1872 was not universally received and has no ecumenical authority. Beyond that, however, what exactly did the Council condemn? There are a number of very free translations of the Council on the Internet. You might read that the Council condemned racism. It didn't. You might read that the Council condemned nationalism. It didn't. What the council condemned was tribalism, quote, in the church, unquote. Basically, the council affirmed, and this much is quite true, 
that ethnicity is not a canonical or ecclesiological principle. There are really only two ecclesiological positions, you, principles you need to know. First, there can be only one bishop in a city. This is derived from the New Testament. We are told that on the Lord's day, believers in a given city gathered epitoafto in the same place. In other words, there should be only one Eucharistic gathering in a location. Therefore, there can only be one bishop in that location. The second principle comes from Apostolic Canon 34, which says that the bishops in a region should meet periodically under the presidency of the bishop of the metropolis, i.e. the metropolitan. And that's it. Everything else is what Marx might have called superstructure. Notice, however, that both principles are concerned with territoriality. One bishop in a given locality and the bishops of the neighboring localities in a region forming a synod. At that time, the regions themselves were determined by the administration, administrative divisions of the Roman Empire. Canonically speaking, then, the question of ethnicity simply doesn't come into it. Now, two observations immediately suggest themselves. First, ethnophilitism is only a heresy when Bulgarians do it. <laughs> when Greeks do it, it's called preserving the glories of Hellenism. In fact, the council condemned the Bulgarians for doing what the Greeks had been doing for centuries. Here's what Constantine Leontiev had to say about this. Both you Greeks and the Bulgarians can equally be accused of philatism, that is, of introducing ethnic interest into the church questions and in the use of religion as a political weapon. But the difference lies in the fact that Bulgarian philatism is defensive while yours is offensive. Their philatism seeks only to mark out the boundaries of their tribe, Yours seeks to cross the boundaries of Hellenism. The second observation is that the entire existence of the Orthodox Church in Western Europe and the Americas sits afoul of this condemnation. The only jurisdiction that does not violate it by definition is the OCA, and even here the OCA has two non-territorial, that is non-canonical ethnic dioceses, and on top of that, and in spite of its name, the OCA is still largely the hunky church in America. And note, it's not the Orthodox Church in America. It is not that. It is that. It is not the Orthodox Church of America. All of which, by way of preface, brings me to my subject. Granted that there can or should be only one church in a given geographic area, what sort of church should that be? The answer, historically speaking, is that the church expresses the dominant ethnos and ethos of that territory. As Christianity was largely an urban phenomenon at first, and with major cities of the empire being multi-ethnic trading centers, it is no surprise that early Christianity, once it ceased being almost exclusively Jewish, took on a cosmopolitan flavor, with Greek being the lingua franca. It did not take long, however, before ethnic and disti uh, distinctions began to manifest themselves, with regional differences in language, music, and liturgy becoming more pronounced. We do ourselves a disservice by referring to autocephalous churches as national churches, for the canonical boundaries of a given church do not necessarily correspond to contemporary political boundaries. If churches had to conform to political maps, autocephalous churches would pass in and out of existence at bewildering speed. Meyendorf used to refer to patriarchates as overgrown regional synods, and I think that's a useful way to look at them. Canonically speaking, what matters are the diocese and the local synods. Autocephalous super synods are again superstructure. Therefore, my concern today has absolutely nothing to do with the question of American autocephaly or even universal or jurisdictional unity or how such things might even be achieved. Today, I really don't care. My concern is with the character or the ethos of the church in my neck of the woods. And this is ultimately why the Ludwell Fellowship was founded to explore what it means for the Orthodox Church to be the church in and of Dixie's land. I want to build the rest of my talk around three vignettes. The first vignette takes us to our nation's capital, where there is an icon of a former slave. 
The second takes place on the porch of a boarding house in the city of Talkingham, and the third in a parish of the Evangelical Orthodox Church. Father Moses Berry has often told the story of his first visit to St. Cyprian of Carthage Church in Richmond, Virginia. He was at, visited at the invitation of friends, but was apprehensive in part because he knew that this would be a white church where the people would be oh so glad to have a black man come visit them. But he noticed something strange on the iconostasis. Next to the picture of Jesus was the picture of a black man, St. Moses the Ethiopian. Father Moses has spoken about how moved he was to see a saint looking back at him that looked just like him. The message was, this is a church where you belong. This vignette is a beautiful reminder of how important it is for all of us to find ourselves, our lives, our histories, and our culture reflected in the way we worship. We are not disembodied spirits alone, worshiping the alone. We are sons and daughters, grandsons and granddaughters, fathers and mothers, husbands and wives. These relationships make us who we are, and we bring all of this with us into the house of God. It is no small thing, then, to know that this house is filled with our people and embraces our history, our language, our music, and our culture. But while the displaying of Western or African saints and naming churches after Western saints like St. Cyprian is a good place to start, it is not nearly enough. Which brings me to the second vignette. We find ourselves on the front porch of a boarding house in the city of Talkingham, where Hazel Motes has presented himself in search of a room. The landlady, noticing Hazel's black suit and wide-brimmed black hat, divines that he is some sort of preacher. What she does not know is that, like Jonah, Hazel is running away from his calling. Nevertheless, he has, to coin a phrase, finally surrendered to the ministry, but on his own terms. Hazel Motes is the founder and preacher of the Church of Jesus Christ without Christ. It hasn't got any Jesus to die for you and make you feel guilty. Hearing this, the landlady thinks for a minute. Protestant or something foreign? <laughs> oh, no, ma'am. Protestant. O'Connor, of course, is having a bit of fun here at her Protestant reader's expense. But as a Catholic in the South, she was well aware that her neighbors considered her Catholicism to be something foreign, a prejudice dating back to Henry VIII's unfortunate marital habits. O'Connor knew, and we know, that the dichotomy of Protestant or foreign is false. By the late unpleasantness, Bardstown, Kentucky was one of the largest Catholic dioceses in the entire country. And of course, those areas that were originally settled by the Spanish and French were heavily Catholic. Moreover, every single Protestant church sprang originally from the Roman church, the fevered fantasies of the landmarkists notwithstanding. And we know, of course, that the Roman church was Orthodox for a millennium. But false dichotomy or no, the truth is that the Orthodox Church in America and in Europe presents herself as something foreign. Never, never, said St. John Maximovich, let anyone tell you that in order to be Orthodox, you must become Eastern. But I don't think anyone really believes that. Many, if not most of our churches, proclaim their foreignness in bold letters right on the signage. Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Serbian Orthodox, Antiochian Orthodox. And if anyone doesn't understand the foreigner, foreignness of the latter, it's only because we're the only people who know what the word Antiochian means. <laughs> and even when we do not proclaim our foreignness in so many words, we do so with our architecture, our music, and our food festivals. I loved Archbishop Dimitri, and I will be the first to admit that St. Seraphim Cathedral is a beautiful church but it is utterly out of place in Dallas, Texas. It looks like it was beamed over from Rostov. They took the word Russian out of the title of the church decades ago, but then turned around and built a Russian temple in the middle of the Republic of Texas. The Metropolitan Cathedral of the so-called Autocephalous Church in America is quite literally a Russian war memorial chapel. 
How are we to grow into a truly indigenous church when we cannot seem to imagine a temple that doesn't look like it came from the Balkans? Even when we convert existing churches, the first thing we do is stick an onion dome on the thing as if that is what makes a temple orthodox. There have been some recent attempts at creating a vernacular orthodox architecture. Andrew Gould has done some very good designs. But these churches are conspicuous by their rarity. They need to become the rule, not the exception. We say everyone is welcome, and I think for the most part we mean that. And yet we are welcome to enter foreign-looking buildings, sing or listen to foreign music, and I'm not even, don't even get me started about Greek and Slavonic in the services. And in general, to find our place among the panoply that is immigrant orthodoxy. In 200 years, we have done little to nothing to enculturate orthodoxy into this land, in stark contrast to the ways in which Russians, especially those in the North, developed their own unique liturgical architecture and musical styles. My thesis is that in order for the Orthodox Church to survive in North America, much less thrive and grow, she will have to become a truly indigenous church, with roots sunk deep into the culture and expressing the particular genius of this land and its people. To the extent the Orthodox Church in the West remains a foreign church, she will be doomed to irrelevance, if not outright extinction. Now, in saying that Orthodoxy must become indigenous, I am not saying that people of Greek or Slavic descent have to forget about their ancestry. I am an ethnophilatist after all. But at some point, people have to make up their minds just where it is they're living. You know, I'm quite proud of my Scottish ancestry. My cells are filled with books on Scottish history, culture, and literature. I have a kilt, which I wear on occasion. The sound of the pipes gets my blood stirring. But for all of that, I am not a Scot. I'm a Southerner. William McGehey sailed from Edinburgh to Virginia in 1654. My people have been here for going on 370 years, more than enough time for us to have lost our brogue. Going native doesn't mean denying your own unique ancestry, but it does mean reconciling yourself to the fact that here is not back there and that here has its own culture. Nor does becoming indigenous mean that we must forget or denigrate the sacrifices made by all of those immigrants who brought orthodoxy to North America and kept the flame alive amidst great adversity. You know, I probably learned more from Paul Laser than anybody else at St. Vladimir's. And I remember him telling a story about a young priest on one of his first assignments who was confronted by an electric candelabra in the altar of his new church. I assume it was the Seven Branch. Being a good seminary graduate and suitably appalled by this breach of liturgical etiquette and good taste, he removed the offending object. Then all hell broke loose. The parish warden told him he couldn't do that. The Watsits donated that in memory of their parents who were stalwarts of this parish. It has a memorial plaque. You cannot throw it out. As I recall, a compromise was reached. The candelabra was brought back into the altar, but it was dewired and fitted with proper votive lamps. You see, we can honor the church's immigrant past and all of the contributions and sacrifices of the Botsaris and Shaheens and Hunchaks, but do so in a way that is faithful to the church's missionary imperative and the needs of new generations of Orthodox Americans. The Dust Bowl was not a natural occurrence. It was a man-made disaster. Farmers plowed up all of the native prairie grasses in order to plant shallow-rooted cash crops. When drought came, and droughts always come, the cash crops dried up and died. But the real tragedy was that since they were so shallow-rooted, when strong winds came, and strong winds inevitably come, the topsoil itself blew away. Now, the Church of Jesus Christ will never disappear from the earth, for the gates of hell cannot prevail against her. But that is no guarantee that the Church will survive in any particular location. Unless the Orthodox Church is able to sink her roots deep into the soil of this land, she just might not survive the adversity that is coming. 
A foreign plant will be unable to save either itself or its adopted soil. Which brings me to the third vignette. In the 1970s, a group of evangelical ministers connected with Campus Crusade came to the conclusion that in order to be faithful to the gospel, they needed to go back past the Reformation to the early church. So they formed the New Covenant Apostolic Order. By the early 80s, they had become the Evangelical Orthodox Church and began to reach out to the canonical church. Some of the people they contacted were welcoming and helpful. Others, like the Greek bishop I mentioned earlier, less so. Amongst the helpful were Archbishop Dimitri of Blessed Memory and Father Alexander Schmemann. There's a story that Father Schmemann visited one of their parishes. Schmemann found his way into so many legends, I have no idea which ones are true and which ones are false, but I'm not going to let that get in the way of a good story. So during the liturgy at communion, when the deacon came out and said something to the effect of, in the fear of God and with faith and love, the congregation responded by singing, Just as I am without one plea but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. And the story goes, Schmemann loved that. He thought it was great. Because these guys, who are still very much Protestant in their mindset, got it. They understood that communion is indeed an altar call, a call to repentance and encounter with the living Christ, and they expressed it in a way that was understandable to themselves. Around 1987 or so, the EOC was received into the Antiochian Archdiocese and became the Antiochian Evangelical Orthodox Mission. Within a few years, however, the AOM was dissolved and all of its parishes folded into the diocesan structure, which made perfect canonical sense. But I don't know that canonicity was uppermost in Metropolitan Philip's mind. Because of the Toledo schism, which left an indelible impression on him, the Metropolitan placed a premium on unity and on uniformity. When I st first started visiting St. Ignatius in Franklin, Tennessee, they still used guitars. It was very much like a folk mass. Over the years, these peculiarities faded away. Today, you would be hard-pressed to tell any difference whatsoever between one of these former AOM parishes and any other parish of the archdiocese, save perhaps those parishes that are overwhelmingly Arab. Today, St. Ignatius has a beautiful Byzantine temple with beautiful Byzantine icons. While I can only rejoice at the spiritual and liturgical maturation of these parishes, I cannot help but feel, however, that something has actually been lost along the way, namely any sense of the local. I'm certainly not suggesting that these parishes start singing Protestant hymns or bring back their guitars, but I am suggesting that the sort of bland, pan-Orthodox, generic American model that some seem to favor has no more of a future than the immigrant church model. It is all well and good to say that the church is a mosaic of all kinds of ethnicities coming together to form a beautiful pan-Orthodox image of Christ. But the tesserae of any mosaic must be embedded in something, or else the tesserae will scatter and the image be lost. That something is local culture. Now, I know that these mosaic parishes, as I call them, are doing very well right now, and I rejoice at that, I really do. But this is not a long-term solution because there is simply no such thing as a generic American culture into which this multiplicity of ethnicities can be embedded. There is no real American culture because Americans are not now and have never been a single ethnos. Homo Americanus is a fiction. What we have in North America are distinctive regional identities and cultures. The South, rural New England, the upper Midwest, the Northwest. These cultures are the product of distinct peoples who have evolved distinctive ways of understanding themselves and relating to the world. If orthodoxy is to become indigenous in North America, she must become embedded in these regional cultures, not in some mythical American culture. Indeed, to the extent that there is a generic American culture today, it consists primarily of consumerism, Disney media, 
and sodomy. <laughs> Frankly, Metropolitan Phillip's idea of being an American was short services, pews, and making sure his clean-shaven clergy never wore their cassocks in public. But lest I be accused of picking on my Antiochian friends, and I've probably spent more time in Antiochian parishes than in OCA parishes, I want to say three things in Metropolitan Phillips' favor. First, he had the courage to bring the EOC into the church when the Greeks turned their backs and the OCA balked at receiving entire parishes. Second, he never equivocated on moral issues. One simply cannot imagine some of the nonsense that's come out of GoArk or in even the OCA occasionally coming out of Metropolitan Phillips Archdiocese. Finally, and this is where I want to go, he was a supporter of his archdiocese, Western Rite Vicarate. Two different people on opposite ends of the South have contacted me through the fellowship and told me that they go to Western Rite parishes, in part at least because they want a church that is familiar, that doesn't seem so foreign. Now, I'm not convinced that the Western Rite is the answer to the questions I'm posing today, but it absolutely must be part of the conversation. It is inconceivable that we can make orthodoxy indigenous in this part of the world while completely ignoring the very real orthodox legacy of the West's squandered religious patrimony. I mentioned St. John Maximovich a minute ago. While St. John is perhaps best remembered for his care of the Russian refugees, especially his orphans, that he shepherded from China to the Philippines to the U.S., when he was in France, he actually helped create a Western Rite French church, specifically as a way of reclaiming the West patrimony. Unfortunately, the ECOF has drifted in and out of canonicity over the years, and so things did not turn out as St. John might have hoped. But at least he did something. This very Russian man with a very Russian flock in distress themselves Nevertheless, since the need for orthodoxy to find deep roots in these new lands, and like any good missionary, he sought out that which was good and true and beautiful in the soil and sought to cultivate that. If orthodoxy is to survive in the West, and not just survive, but grow and thrive, she must sink her roots deep, not in some generic Western or American culture, but into the fertile soil of specific localities and their particular cultures. At the same time, she must reclaim the lost spiritual heritage of the Latin tradition, because that is the heritage of the Anglos and Saxons and Celts, not to mention the Franks and the Norse, who ended up settling this part of the world. Nor are these two imperatives unrelated to each other. For regional diversity was a hallmark of Western Christianity up until the Counter-Reformation. It was the Council of Trent that imposed liturgical uniformity on the West. And the attempt by the ECOF to revive the local Gallican Rite, even if the experiment did not exactly succeed, nonetheless represents a laudable attempt to manifest the universal appeal of orthodoxy within the context of a specific local culture. I said earlier that I was not concerned about autocephaly or jurisdictional unity, and I'm not. I don't care if my bishop is a foreigner who speaks broken English and answers to the patriarch of far, far away. So long as he has a genuine heart for mission, loves the people he has come to evangelize, and like St. John, is willing to actually do something to create a truly indigenous church. In the absence of such a visionary hierarch, I'm afraid, however, I have little confidence in the assembly of bishops or our seminaries to address these questions. My talk today has been long on invective and short on concrete proposals. I do not claim to know the answers to these fundamental questions, but at this point it is trouble enough to simply pose them. I have been deliberately provocative because I want to wake us all up from our complacency. These questions surrounding the enculturation of orthodoxy in the West, and specifically here in the South, are questions of existential moment. They are not mere academic exercises. I firmly believe that the survival of orthodoxy in the West depends upon them. 
May our merciful Lord, through the prayers of St. John of San Francisco and of Archbishop Dimitri of Dallas, grant us the courage and the strength and the grace to confront them.